tell us how you actually did get started. Um, I think you'd left Cornwall and gone to Scotland. That was in 1946, which is a long time ago now. And um, I mean, it was a completely different everything, lifestyle, situation, to what it had been before. Because all of a sudden I was domiciled in a completely different part of the world at a, not a, a rather, um, well it was definitely a watershed time at the end of the war, but it wasn't particularly creative I don't think. Um, and it was a question of just changing one's whole attitude and starting off on a new venture really. So was writing about Cornwall then a sort of remedy for homesickness or...? Oh yes it was and, and also I hadn't been in Cornwall for a long long time. I'd been away in the war and in various <laughs> um, naval stations and then I went out to the Far East in about uh, 40, 44, I think it was, 43, and that was me until the end of the war, really. So I was always on the move and doing things, but I was very glad to get back to Cornwall again. And then I met Graham and we decided to get married. And that was it, we stayed married <laughs> for another 70 years. And I liked um, the way of life, which suited me very well. <coughs> and I had four children, which was all most of my time. <laughs> Amazing you managed to have time to write the books as well. Yeah, I did. I don't know quite how I did it, but if you really want to do something, you can always make time for it, I think. Do you remember who you were reading at the time? Was there any... Was there an author out there who you had respect for? Or... Oh, yes. It, at the time. I mean, I do... It was lovely at your party, at Hatchard's meeting, um, Penelope Lively, because she's been one of my most revered writers for a long time. I think she's wonderful. I think she writes wonderful books. And she never loses touch with reality, but she's still very emotive, I think. Was it at all difficult writing or pursuing a career then? No, it was, it was really a, a terribly good time to start because the markets were simply bursting uh, with um, opportunities if you wrote my sort of short story. Um, you know, every single magazine ran a, a, a serial or ran a, a full length book or so there was endless opportunities for markets and you just had to go out and grab them really. Did it change a lot over the next Well yeah years? because it, the, 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 the fiction market just disappeared right. uh, with um, I suppose television and various other things and also the stories were rather feeble you know, there was, the, the standard wasn't very brilliantly high, which was again made it easier for people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, then, and then along came the Shell Seekers. Yeah, and, that was, I, and I did quite a lot of, I did quite a lot of novels for Tom Dunn before the Shell Seekers. And then, you know, it's sort of classic remark. The children said, why aren't you making our mother a bestseller? And Tom said, well, so far I, I, I can't 
think of anything I'd like more, but I haven't got the material for it. You'll be quite frank about it. Your mother doesn't write bestseller material. So I thought, oh, that's awful. So I wrote The Shell Seekers and away we went. It was wonderful. Do you remember the day that he phoned and said it was a New York Times bestseller? Yeah, but it wasn't him. It was, uh, was it? I'm not sure it wasn't my daughter. Ran up and said, you're well done, you're on the New York Times bestseller list. And that was really terrific. It really was. Very exciting. Is The Shell Seekers, therefore, a favourite book of yours? Yes, it is. Also because of the content. Yes. And because I was writing about what I really knew about, which was, I suppose you could say, painting and artists and that sort of life. Mm. And also because I loved writing about St. Ives. And I was, in a way, very happy writing that book. It was a good, good story and it was fun to write. Have you been to each of the places that you have set your books in? Yes, Spain and Lots in there Scotland. There was a, one book called Sleeping Tiger, which was all about Spain. And it did very well. It was, uh, it was quite successful. I've just read that one, funnily enough. Have you? Yes, I absolutely a, loved quite it. Quite a funny book. Yes, yeah. yes. You got <laughs> good banter going in that one. Yeah. Do you have any idea what the magic is, why your books are still so popular today? Well, it took me a long time before they were. You know, I've done the whole, the whole thing of uh, waiting for the, for the magic word, which would say, you know, you've done it, you've actually... And that was when Pippa spoke to me at last on the telephone from New York and said, well done. And that was sort of the beginning of thinking, maybe after all I am a writer, I'm not just a, you know, a scribbler for women's magazine. And is there a character from all of them that you are especially pleased with or fond of, who you remember with with fondness, I suppose, any of the characters from any of the books? Any of the situations or...? Or the people that you wrote yeah. about, that you put into the books? Yes. Who is your favourite? I think some of the older people. I rather like yeah. writing about older people. And I always did before I was old myself. <laughs> but um, that was where, as a child, one got a lot of vibes was from older people who suddenly sat down on the chair and started talking and were really quite happy to be with you. I think I, I like that. I like having attention and pays and people talking and telling me things. What do you think today's readers are going to take from your books? It's kind of a tricky question, that one. No. Uh, well, maybe uh, the pace of a time gone by. I don't look over my shoulder and say everything was wonderful, because in fact it wasn't. It was quite boring and very stultified, I think is the word. People were very conventional and never went beyond the boundaries, you know, which was dull, very boring. And I suppose listeners to the new audio books are going to be that much more involved in the atmosphere, listening to it. Good, yeah, yeah. I think that's good. Um, I suppose a good story will go on forever, though, won't it? 
And I suppose that's what continues to appeal to... Yeah, I suppose so. ...to readers. I suppose, in a way. I'm not very religious, but I suppose well, it's one of the things that keeps people reading the Bible. It's full of terrific stories. Um, and so far, people don't seem to have got... Well, I don't know. But I think that, you know, they are. They're good, they're good tales of adventure. They are. And you also wrote quite a lot about young women making pivotal direct decisions about their lives. Yes. And forging their own paths. And maybe that is still um, a truth yeah. to young readers today. An, an intergenerational conflict. And we were brought up, you know, with <coughs> British India and that sort of thing. And what you did and what you didn't do. Which was, I think, rather dull in a way. But people were more exciting. They did exciting things and they were quite entertaining. How do you mean in terms of what they got up to? Yes. And I mean, all sorts of... Well, the, the people I knew really quite well. I knew all his nephews and nieces. And he was an older but a nice man. And he... Uh, ran all the elephants in Burma and did the long trek up to Assam with children and wives all sitting on the backs of elephants. And I remember him, he was a sweet man. And sort of people like that popped out of the woodwork and gave us some idea about or fame and knowledge experience. What advice, Rose, would your 93-year-old self give to your 18-year-old self? Just about to get Just married. stick in there, really. I think, don't think there's anything else. Just do it. Get on with it. Don't talk about it, just do it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to hear anyone say, oh, I haven't got time, and you're so lucky. And, you know, just do, just do it. Don't talk about it. <laughs>